Well, this morning we're looking at giving styles, at different patterns we have for giving. And uh, I was kind of surprised a few years ago to run into some research that suggested we're wired in different ways and that that's okay. Uh, I mean this by that. Uh, I, I grew up, I've got a personal giving style. It was the way I was trained. It fits my personality and, and who I am in Jesus. And I always thought that my personal giving style was like the giving style, the best, the one, and, and if not the only, then at least the one that everybody else should aspire to when they finally grew up in the faith as much as I was. Uh, so today I'd like to share some research with you, and I want you to listen for ways in which you recognize yourself. In fact, at some point today, I'd like you to turn to somebody next to you or even say to yourself, hey, I think that might be me. Uh, there's actually, you could divide these kind of giving styles down a lot further than just three, but I've grouped a couple together to get three major sections. And you fi might find yourself, you, you know, all, generaliz all generalizations are false. Think about that for a minute. Uh, all generalizations are false, um, including this one. But they, there are some truths here. So you might find yourself overlapping a little bit. You might find yourself dead center in one of these styles. And, and what... I think we want to come away with today is this sense that God has created me and wired me this way, so all three of these big overarching styles are good and can be in Christ God-pleasing. And because we're also stinking sinners, that means all three of these giving styles can be corrupted by sin and twisted and used to hurt the body rather than uplift the body. So there's sin in all three sections, in, including my favorite and your favorite. And there's a way to renew our minds in Jesus, where Jesus lifts us up and says, now in me, I've given you a way of being who you are, only forgiven and cleansed. So a way to renew our minds in each of these sections too. You see, the, our, our first picture for today is this kind of family meal going on. And that goes with the broad category, the first broad category that we have today. Uh, the, you might call these the family providers, big, big category, family providers. Uh, a little over 40% of us, if we're at all like the national average, uh, about 40% of us, a little bit more actually, are family providers. Now here's some basics about how family providers work. Uh, family providers uh, see an important responsibility first and foremost to, well, yeah, provide for their families. That's why they're family providers. Uh, they provide for the family first, and if there's anything left over, then they will give from the abundance. So first, I'm going to care for my family, and if I see that there's anything left over, then I'll give freely and generously with that over abundance. Family providers tend to be very cautious about how they give because they want to make sure there's enough to provide for the needs of their family, and then they'll give with the rest. Uh, not inherently bad, not inherently good, just the way about 40% of us are wired. There's good, bad, and ugly with all three of these. The good for family providers is this. Uh, God uses you to provide for your family. That's one of the most important ways you give. One of the things that you need to do as a family provider is provide for those people that you identify as in your circle, in your family. Now, if you're a mom or dad or a grandma or grandpa, that makes pretty easy sense as you make a transition from kind of childhood and adolescence into adulthood and single adulthood and independence, that circle begins to shift some too. So you provide for yourself as a member of your family, but then you also end up having one or two or three close friends that you, you would rather make sure your friend has the books they need for that next class than give to save the whales. That's just how you're wired. You're going to care for your inner circle first. If there's any left over, then you'll give more generously. And that's good. We do have a responsibility and should feel responsibility to care for the people that God has placed in our lives. We give carefully and thoughtfully. And Jesus even suggests we might want to consider the cost before we set out on a venture. So we'll give in a planned and careful way. And those are all good things. Now, the, the bad side, the, the, the underbelly of this kind of giving style is that viewing myself as a family provider can foster the attitude that I'm in charge of my finances. I've earned these things. My responsibility is to give, and I'm going to fulfill that responsibility 
by doing these things that I do to get my money to provide for my family and friends. See how I-centered that can be? It ends up being very self-centered and perhaps even self-righteous. Look what I'm doing to provide for my family. It can, if you're not careful, take God out of the equation. And it could get even worse in this sense. Caution is good. Remember, caution is one of the things inherent to family providers. They give but with caution. Uh, Caution is good, but sometimes hiding behind caution or in the guise of caution, dressing up like caution and going door-to-door trick-or-treating is something you might call fear. I'm going to use this caution. I'm presenting it as caution, but what's behind it is I'm afraid that if I give generously with this money, I'm not going to have enough. Remember, I'm hardwired to make sure I can provide for my family. And there's no way I'm going to take a loaf of bread off of my kid's table or out of my friend's lunchbox in order to give it to someone else. This is my first calling, and I'm going to give here first. That can turn into, there's no way I'm going to take the steak and potatoes off of my... My kids deserve shrimp cocktail and porterhouse steak every night, and there's no way I'm going to take that off their table just so I can help somebody... In need. So there's a sense in which you will never have enough or can never provide enough for your family or your friends. And then there's a fear lurking behind the caution. If I give this check to someone else, I might not have enough. The, the purpose of looking at all these giving styles is so that we might come to a result of more joyful response in what God is doing for us in Jesus Christ. We want to give and give generously and give joyfully. So for family providers, one of the biggest obstacles to joyful giving is fear. Fear of not being able to provide enough. Everything we think our family needs or deserves. In the face of that fear, Jesus brings us to our providing Father. That's one of the most important ways the Bible has to talk about God our Father. You can see it in a couple Bible verses. They're printed in your worship folder today. They're up here on the screen too. Uh, Romans chapter 8. Yes, there is Romans chapter 8. Will you, I'm going to read the first part, then where it's italics or it's a bold in in your folder too. Will you read out loud the second half? He who did not spare his own son, but gave himself up for us all, So think about that logic for a second. If God was willing to give you Jesus, don't you think he's willing to give you everything else you need? Uh, Are you the one who's in charge? Do you bear the full primary burden and responsibility for providing for your family or circle of friends? No, you can't bear that burden. That burden belongs to God and God alone. And if he gave Jesus, won't he give everything else as well? Or how about this from Matthew chapter 6? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And now say this one with me. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. There, explicitly in Matthew 6, Jesus points to our need and our dependence on God, and not just a random God somewhere up in the heavens, but a personal God, Jesus invites us to see as Father. So that new relationship with the Heavenly Father gives us a new way of thinking about giving. It might be what you could call renewing our minds. Because Jesus brings us back to our Heavenly Father, that means he makes us immediately a part of his family. Because of Jesus, the God of all creation loves us and takes care of our needs. And if God's taking care of our needs and we're all in one family, then you can see how the thinking of a family provider can begin to shift and can begin to change. The the circle of people in a family provider's life that they feel a responsibility towards, a, a joyful burden towards, those people begin to include this 
family of faith. If God is our Father and we are brothers and sisters, then this is also one of the places I want to make sure has what it needs to thrive and be successful. God is providing for His church through His people. God provides for University Lutheran Chapel through you. God provides for this family of faith here in the St. Luke multi-site through its members. There's nothing we can do here that isn't provided for through our people. We are one family in Christ. And as you look at the responsibility that you have to provide for your families, Jesus invites you to see this faith family as a part of that extended circle. So that as you bring an offering forward, as you provide for this family of faith, you can experience a joy and generous giving knowing that you are doing something that you're hardwired to do. Uh, let me just read Galatians 6 for you. This is a great image too from Paul. Paul says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Paul was writing to family providers when he wrote Galatians 6, verse 10. Is it good to do good for everyone? Yes. And the family provider says, first I will make sure my family is taken care of. And then I will also worry about everybody else. So as a family provider, and I invite you to consider the mission and ministry of your congregation. Without you, we don't move forward. And as you look at a wide range of places to give, even year-end giving, have you started getting those mail-in requests yet? You probably have, and if not, they'll be coming out. It's kind of right before Thanksgiving, you get Christmas cards and then the donation letters. You, you, you get year-end giving, find a place to give. And I want you to be joyful and generous and free to give to Save the Whales or the local fire department or uh, the homeless shelter or friends indeed. I want you to feel joyful and able to give there. And consider also your family of faith and the needs that we have in Christ. Because God has made us one family. And then keep in mind, for family first givers, joy will increase as we come to see this place as our faith home and these people as our faith family. There's a duty, a, a privilege, a joy to provide for these people to whom we belong in Christ. Amen. Family providers are the first main category, a little over 40% of us. The second big category, you could call burden sharers. Again, over, just over 30% of us here. So we've got family providers and then just over 30% would be burden sharers. You can see the picture here, right? What's the guy doing? What, can you tell in the picture from way back there? What's he doing? Moving a couch. And you can't see the other person, but you know there's another person, right? He's, he's not... That's impossible unless somebody else is carrying it with him. So burden sharers is the second big category. And for burden sharers, they like to do, you guessed it, their fair share. Carry their part of the load. Burden sharers enjoy giving to specific ministries because they like to see their gifts played out in action. Nothing inherently bad with being hardwired as a burden sharer. In fact, there's a lot of good stuff and there's some words of caution too. So in the good category comes the fact that we want to be part of a team. We want to feel like we're not alone when we give and give generously. We want to know that our financial gifts are being used wisely and making an impact. And that's good. It makes sense to give where it's going to be used to have an impact. Now, it can go wrong when sin sneaks into this burden share mentality. When giving becomes centered on me and on my agenda and on what I want to see happen. In that case, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but it's possible for money to become an instrument of power, for a way, a way to, for me to, in a very important way, cast my vote to get what I want to see done. And it gets even worse than that when there's division in the body of Christ it can turn into a we versus they mentality. If you're a burden sharer and you've got very specific ideas of how you want to share your burden, then it's possible for you to withhold your gift 
You can stop giving generously if there's division, if you don't agree with someone uh, as a way of punishing other people on the team. Remember, family first givers, they fear, face the fear of not being able to provide for their families. And, and in the face of that fear, Jesus provides for our needs and makes us one family. Now, the burden sharers aren't concerned with the same kinds of things. They're not concerned with providing for uh, their family so much as making sure other people are also carrying their own load. If it feels like you're hauling this couch by yourself, you're likely to just drop your end because you know it's not possible. Or, even worse, if the other person carrying the couch with you offends you in some way, one of your natural responses is to drop your side of the couch and walk away. Let me take my ball and go home because I don't like what you just did there. So division within the, the body is one of the real obstacles to these kind of givers. Burden sharers don't handle diversity from a generous perspective very well. So for them, the greatest obstacle to, for joyful giving isn't fear, it's division. Broken relationships or a, a lack of trust, not feeling like part of the team, a desire to control what happens in the church, all of those things can rob the joy of giving from the little more than 30% of us that could be labeled burden sharers. In, in the face of that uh, negative reaction to division, Jesus comes in with a message for burden sharers. Jesus comes in to say, it's not that your divisions don't matter, but I'd like to give you something in place of that. I'd like to renew your minds. Jesus overcomes our divisions and our pride by giving us his spirit. And one of the fundamental job descriptions of the Spirit is to make us one, is to bring us together, is to unite us. So again, we've got some Bible verses. This one's from 1 Corinthians 12. And again, I ask you to read with me the, the things in italics or in your bulletin in bold. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we're all given one spirit to drink. As it is, there are many parts, but one body. So, so the guy carrying the couch, we tend to think of it this way. I'm carrying my end of the couch, and he's carrying his end of the couch, and if he's not doing his job, I'm not going to do my job either. Or if he says something that I don't like, I'm going to drop my end of the couch and step back, because we have to be in relationship we have to share this burden equally and fairly if I'm going to be engaged and be joyful. But what if, instead of seeing two people sharing the couch, what if we started thinking of it more like one hand lifting the couch together? What, what if we started acting as if we were actually one body in Christ? In, in that sense, it would not make sense for the pinky to say, I'm not a thumb and I've always wanted to be a thumb, and as long as that thumb is hanging around here, I'm not going to carry the couch. Or the thumb were to say, I'm not a finger. You guys call yourselves fingers, and I technically am not a finger, and I just don't feel like we're on the same hand anymore. Uh, I better stop this illustration pretty quick before I go somewhere I don't want it to go. Uh, it doesn't make sense for a finger to say to the hand, I'm not going to be a part of the hand anymore. We're part of the same body. And yes, there are times when we don't agree. There are times when we, you could say, step on each other's toes. There's times we will even offend each other because of sin. But fundamentally, this truth, remains true even when we disagree and even when we hurt each other. We're a part of one body. That's not just seen externally by two people carrying a couch. It's much more intimate than that. We're not just on the same team. We're a part of the same body. And Paul has, has long paragraphs that get rather complicated about the eye saying to the toe, I'm not an ear, so I can't be on the face. Very loose paraphrase. Uh, but if we're part of one body, we come to see ourselves in a different light. Our giving, our generosity, our service no longer becomes a way of me being able to make sure someone else is doing their fair share. In fact, fair takes on a new meaning. Because of our natural human tendencies, we think this way. I need to look at what everyone else is doing 
and then I want to do a fair and equal share. So if you're giving in a way that's appropriate to your income and doing your fair part, then I'm going to do my fair share too. The problem with that is it's always asking me to judge the people around me before I do anything graciously or joyfully from my heart. And you know what? People are always going to disappoint me. I can always find someone around here not doing their fair share. I mean, I don't need to know their personal story. I don't need to know what they're going through financially. I don't need to know what's going on in their life. I can judge them like that and use that judgment as an excuse to say, nope, they're not carrying their burden. I'm not going to carry mine. So if you want to be a fair share giver that gives joyfully and freely, then you shift your attention from the people around you and you look instead to what, what God's given you. Don't base your fair share on what other people are doing. Look at what God gives you and then say, what, what's the fair share of my response to that? Because if you're keeping your eyes open to what God is giving you again and again, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, if you have your eyes open to what Jesus is doing in your life and respond to that joyfully and freely, you're never going to be disappointed. You're never going to find that well running dry. Your joy will only increase as you give. When you begin to recognize that we're on the same hand, we're a part of the same body, we're in this together, kind of whether we like it or not. And once I get beyond that fact, once I get beyond the fact that you guys are a bunch of idiots that are going to step on my toes sometimes, I mean, you know, I, I love you and all. But once I get past the fact that we're all sinful humans together, then for a fair share, a burden share, then the joy opens up. Then they can grab a hold of that couch and say, come on guys, let's get going then they can be sinned against and forgive without letting that affect their generous response to a God who pours out blessings in their life. If you're a burden sharer, you want to know what you're doing matters. And it goes to support a ministry that impacts real lives. Have you, have you begun to recognize yourself? I mean, at, technically at this point, about three quarters of you should have started to say, hey, that might be me. Either the family provi providers or the burden sharers. In one of those two categories, about three quarters of us live pretty well. Uh, before we leave the, the burden sharers, I, I want to tell you, I see the impact of your giving. I want to let you know when, when you put money in an offering plate here at the chapel, it goes to a mission and a ministry that actually impacts lives. And I want you to know I see it. Uh, if you look around today, if, if you've been worshiping here at the chapel for a while, perhaps you get a sense that attendance is, is down a little bit and we're in vacancy and everything isn't running quite as smoothly as it has. And those are both true statements. I want you to look at the numbers in the multi-site and recognize that last weekend on our three sites, we had over 800 people in worship. Our, our numbers aren't down. They're actually up. You just don't always feel it at the 9 o'clock worship service at the chapel. But you're a part of a bigger whole. And even in vacancy, I was just a part of a meeting this last week again with, with primary leaders saying, how are we going to move mission and ministry at the chapel forward in vacancy? Not wait until the next guy shows up, but, but how do we move forward in in a united way in vacancy. And, and that plan is kind of going out from primary leaders to elders to congregation. And, and I can't tell you today yet, but I want to be able to say soon, here's where we're going while we're looking for the next. We're going to keep looking for that next leader that God has for us, but we're not going to, we learn some things through the call process. When Pastor Gadini said, I love you, but I feel like I'm still called here, we talked to him some more and said, you know, that's really helpful. We're going to move forward in a different way. So we're moving forward. I want you to know that I see it, that, that, that you impact real lives when you put money in our offering plate. It, coming in just a few weeks, a couple of weeks, is final fix. We're gonna, we expect again to have over 100 college students who have little or no connection with us to be here while they study. Have you, have you been? Have you come? Have you seen what final fix is like? And in a couple of weeks after that, up in Whitmore Lake, this year it's in Whitmore Lake, the... Uh, Advent by candlelight, well, we'll, we'll have over 100 women. Over half of them will have no connection to St. Luke. Some of them won't know Jesus at all. And they'll gather together, and there will be music, and there will be Bible study, and there will be fellowship, and it will be a way of bringing people together 
It's the kind of thing that you, you need money to pull off, but it's not about the money, it's about the impact. I want you to know that today Pastor Matt's teaching it because I'm here, but we had almost 30 people in a new member class on the, at the St. Luke site this last week, and we're getting to know Jesus better and getting to know each other better. And you know what? There's a couple people from the chapel that are in that class because it's just down the road and they worship here and, and then go to that Bible class because they're going to become a member not of St. Luke's site, but of the St. Luke multi-site. You can see the impact that we have as a multi-site, not just as individual sites together. You can see it in something like you serve, where this fall we have over 100 people getting trained in different ways to use their gifts in active service. You can see it on Wednesday nights in confirmation, where we have families, not just 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, but parents of 6th, 7th, and 8th graders from all three sites, almost 90 people in the gym at the St. Luke site, and they're from the whole multi-site, and they're asking discipling questions in their families, and they're getting to know not only Jesus, but their parents better. You can see lives being changed as youth from all three sites together last week served at a congregation, a mission congregation in Detroit. And today from all three sites, youth are going to a mission outside Lansing to help serve there. They're active, they're engaged, they're getting to know each other better, they're getting to know Jesus better. They're on this journey of faith and they're here together. And it's oh, it's the wonderful ministry opportunities, and then it's also the rather mundane things like lights and screens and sound systems. Uh, there's a chimney that just got repaired here. There's, boy, I, I walked in with Sam Fink and Grass Protecta, baby. That looks great, doesn't it? I just, lo I'd like, I just love saying Grass Protecta. Makes me feel like I'm from the hood or something. Yeah, we got, we got a grass protective system. Don't tread on it. No, you can tread it. Never mind. Uh, new parking spaces, new lights, new parking for the, the lot there. Uh, there's just stuff going on all over the place. I want you to know we don't have it all figured out. We're not perfect. We are sinful. And at the same time, when you choose to make a generous gift to the mission and ministry of the chapel, and of this St. Luke multi-site, I want you to know it impacts lives. It actually does have a kingdom impact. You can see it in our announcement sheets for this week. Hopefully you got this in your email. If you didn't, there are hard copies in the back if you'd like to take it. The head, one of the headline announcements, the spaghetti dinner fundraiser. Why? Because the sewer is broken and we got to fix it. It's going to cost over $25,000. And the Michigan District has said, we are partnering with you and we're going to help pick up some of the tab and we still have an unexpected $25,000 bill. So what do we do as a multi-site? Someone who worships at St. Luke says, let us donate the food and let's all come together and let's try to raise some money to defray that cost. Because it's not about sewers, it's about souls. But we can't rate, you can't reach souls if you can't flush toilets. I think you should tweet that. Um, so, so we joined together as, as a single site, and that's part of what this mission and ministry is about, is a single congregation caring for each other. Underneath that, you see a clip from Carl Medeiros. We brought him in as a multi-site event. We had a couple hundred people there, and not only that, but we captured him on video, and we edited it, and we put it out on YouTube, and there are congregations not just here in our three sites, but throughout Michigan and actually around the world who are sharing content from us because we're having an impact on the kingdom. Look at the three blogs at the bottom of your page. Do you read our blog? Do you know that we had 400 page views on our blog? Not last month, not last week, but yesterday. We average around 400 page views a day. A day? because of the content that you all help provide, because we're pointing people to Jesus and others find it and put it on Facebook and share it. We get people, not just here in Michigan, not just in the United States, but from around the world who are saying, wow, that's content that points me to Jesus. I'm going to grab a hold of that and use that. When you put a dollar in the offering plate, you're supporting a mission and ministry that affects people's real lives. Some of them don't even live here. And some of them live right down the street. It's natural for you as a burden sharer to want to do your part when everyone else is doing their sh fair share too. And that's okay. Just put that in the perspective of God giving you everything in Jesus Christ 
and then the Spirit binding you together as one body. Whether you like it or not, you're part of this community, this oneness in Christ. Family first providers. That's about 40% of us or a little more. And then comes burden sharers. It's another 30%. And if you haven't recognized yourself yet, maybe you fit in this category. A little less than a third of us could be seen as first fruit givers. Now, this is how I was raised. This was an important part of my formation as a follower of Jesus. And I always thought this is the ideal. These people tend to give a percentage, typically off the top, before they do anything else with it. Uh, This is where uh, the concept of tithe, 10% off the top, comes in. I want you to know there are tithers who give 10% or more than 10% who who are fair share givers. For them, fair share is simply 10%. That's, that's what they do. And if they don't like what's going on, maybe they aren't giving 10%. But typically, burden shares can be tithers too. Or family first providers. If they see family, their family of faith as one of the places they need to provide, they will give 8%, 10%, even more off the top. That's another thing they can do. But they're not wired to experience joy that way. So this is what the key difference. It's not just that these are the only people that give 10% or more. They are percentage off the top givers, and that's how they experience joy in giving. So it's not just about the amount they give or the percentage that they give. It's that they're wired to give first fruits, and they give a percentage off the top. Now that's good. It, it, automatic can be faithful. First fruits is an expression of trust. So you see the, the very first red ripe tomato. Don't you love that one? You, you, you got your cherry tomato plants in the backyard and you go out and you see the very first red one. What do you do with that first red one? You eat it. You, you don't even bother to wash it off. I mean, it might be a little dirty. You just rub it a little bit, but you put that in your mouth right away because there's nothing like that first, first fruit. Now, in an Old Testament agrarian culture, to give of the first fruits meant that you were trusting God for the rest. I mean, and if, I, if I bring in the first fruits of my harvest, I'm trusting that there won't be locusts or hail or war that takes away the other 90%. If I'm going to give this first red ripe tomato, then I'm counting on God to come through with the other 90 green ones. So there's a trust that can be expressed in first fruits given. Now, because this is my primary giving style, I didn't even recognize that there's a downside. It's easier to point out the bads for other people. But if you're a first fruits giver, you can also have a bad and an ugly. The bad is simply this. Although automatic can be faithful, automatic can also be mindless or thoughtless or heartless. So giving can get stale or routine. It's ugly when your giving becomes a budget line item. (laughs) And you never think about it. You know, you, you just do an automatic withdrawal and it becomes a part of your budget planning and never again is it an act of worship. It's an act of budget. I don't think God intended first fruit giving to be that way. So Jesus overcomes our fears, the fears especially of the family first providers, by bringing us to the Father, the Father who provides for our family. Jesus overcomes our divisions that which gets in the way of joy for burden shares. Jesus overcomes our division by sending his spirit who makes us one body. Jesus overcomes our hard hearts and stale worship by nothing more than giving us himself. So if you're a percentage off the top first fruits giver, you want to ground that giving again and again in the saving action of Jesus. You can see that pattern already in Deuteronomy chapter 26 as God, through Moses, describes what giving and generosity is supposed to look like. He's got not just a first fruits plan, but a first fruits plan grounded in the saving action of God. This is from Deuteronomy 26. This is telling the common, ordinary, everyday person how they should bring their gift to the Lord. The priest shall take the basket, the basket of first fruits, from your hands and set it down in front of the altar of Yahweh your God. And you shall declare before Yahweh your God. So you bring your offering of first fruits in a basket and then you say in the presence of God, 
My father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, putting us to hard labor. Then we cried out to the Lord our God and uh, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with miraculous signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, O Lord, have given me. Now that's the way to give. I'm bringing first fruits to the God who saved and planted me in this land. And all of this is his. And I'm bringing first fruits that come out of that saving action of God and the blessing he is in my life. So as if you're a first fruits giver, the thought is simply this. We want to center and focus our worship on the saving act, action of God in Jesus Christ for us. So no matter what, what uh, style seems most natural to us, at the center of all of our generosity stands this. God gave us himself in Jesus Christ. God placed us where we are and he continues to provide for us. The foundation of it all is this relationship established by grace through faith for Christ's sake. And that relationship has the power to renew our mind. So if you're a first fruits giver, if if you're just writing a check week after week without even thinking about it, if you've got it on automatic withdrawal and it's not inherently wrong to give online and have an automatic withdrawal, but if you do you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to fight the natural tendency to just make that a natural part of your budget and not an act of worship. So you've got to find a way, even again today, to come to God and say, God, you saved me. You rescued me. In Jesus Christ, you restored me and renewed me. I'm fallen and blind and an enemy, and yet you restored me and forgiven me, and now I come with my gifts in hand. It's not about me. It's about you. And this gift simply acknowledges what you've done for me. Uh, Romans chapter 12 talks about the renewing of our minds. Would you read this with me, please? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Whether you're a family provider or a burden sharer or a first fruits giver, let Jesus renew you in your mind because there's so many things that stand in the way of joyful giving. And the blessing Jesus wants for you today is not merely a new relationship of forgiveness, but a relationship of forgiveness that is the foundation to a joyful life of response. Giving is a part of that response. We join then together as we pray that God would do exactly that, that he would renew our minds and renew our lives. We rise.